Well, uh, the two lawyers, as I said, was Afro-Americans, fine-looking men. Mr. Davis was fine-looking men as they, they, could, uh, they are in this country. And, and Mr. John Gear, they was both wonderful. And they, uh, they uh, what they did, they let me t do the talking. And my sister, she didn't do much at the talking, but I helped the, helped the stand for about two or three hours. That's a long time. Uh, explaining, you know, the situation here in America mm -hmm. and how the... Uh, People, Afro-Americans, Jewish people, and all nationalities were treated. But they didn't like it at the courthouse for two black black uh, people to come in there and defend defend two white women. Mm -hmm. So we got out on bond, and ever since then, the. Uh, the judge here in Atlanta would not make my children's daddy support them because he went and pimped and his brother concerning concerning you know me of being mm -hmm. a CP okay. believer. Okay, now. Okay. Uh, and hold it. You have to speak a little louder to me. Okay. You know. Okay. Okay. Nanny, Nanny, explain to us uh, about the conditions in the plant when you was a little girl, when you first went to work in the mills. Well, uh, the spinning and spooling winders and twisters and drawing was a, uh, it was a hard job. And of course, you was in a lot of danger. You know what I mean, the lint. Mm -hmm. it, Oh, but not like a weed shop. That's the worst part of the cotton mill is the weave. Is the weaving mm -hmm. is what I uh, still is heard today. and estimate. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot about uh, uh, different machines to operate. You know, twisters and spinning, spooling, winders, quillers. But I never. Worked in the wee shop, mm -hmm. but I got the we made the made the beam, beam mm -hmm. a beam. You know what a beam is? Yes, yeah, so it's a no, big quarter. round, big round thread, long as this table. That's what they put on ever we. It's true. Uh, cotton mill people was trashy. They called trash. You know they had no. They didn't care nothing about them, mm -hmm. and uh, the middle class people and the you know people with good educations, they didn't pay us no attention. So you were looked down upon. Yeah, we was looked down upon, mm -hmm. just a bunch of old, old trash. That's the way it was awful. But I didn't tell you enough of going back. Concerning the noise in the cotton mill, okay. you know that. Back at the conditions again, okay. That condition is a cause of people having such a bad hearing, mm -hmm. and uh, also in the wee shop, it's it's uh, the land in it is. My brother lost his life, you know, from weaving, had emphysema. Okay. And that's the way it is. There ain't much of no part of a cotton mill is too healthy. You know that, don't you? So there was no safety precautions in uh, the plant. No, at all. not whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There's no safety for nobody. Have you ever seen anyone or while you was working in the mill, did you ever witness a death? Did you ever see anyone get killed? Uh well out it though. You ever heard since you've been at Atlanta, uh, the Whitaker Mill, yes, I have. Chattahoochee? Right, I have. 
Well, they took them out on stretchers there when my daddy and brothers and sisters worked in the cotton mill. They took them out on stretchers that they couldn't take it, you know, it was so hot, down on the river Mm -hmm. where it really is hot. And they kept the temperature so high. And uh, cotton mills that uh, used to make that blue denim for overalls Mm -hmm. for men, well, they made the... had the dye, you know, and all that old odor of the dye, we'd have to breathe it. And it was very unhealthy. Now, when you went to work, and I would presume you had eight-hour days in the mills, or was it longer than Twelve. Eight, Twelve hours. Did you ever get breaks, or did uh-uh, you have time no to No breaks. Eat? Never no breaks. And you said it was real hot. Was there any windows that you could get the air? Most of the most of the mills that I worked in never opened the windows. They had to force them. My daddy and my brothers forced them out at Whitaker Mill, out at Chattahoochee River. Mm-hmm. They had to force the windows to open there. I didn't work in the Chattahoochee but a short time. Mm-hmm. But they ain't none of the cotton mills what they cracked up to be. They might have changed a little, but it's awful hard work and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Tell me when you're rolling. We're rolling. When you're rolling. We're rolling. Okay, Mr. Brooks, could you tell us uh, that story about President Kennedy. Well, uh, we had a problem, of course, in the South. I'd, I'd really rather start back and tell you something about the history of the South. Uh, see, before the war between the states, we don't call it a civil war <laughs> down there. We call it a war between the states. We had 60% of the wealth of this nation. And after the war was over, we had nothing. Uh, We had no Marshall Plan to help us. In fact, all of the economics that developed was to make, really to impoverish the South. Because, for example, in the case of freight rates, it it took twice as much to ship a manufactured product from the South to the North as it did to ship it from the North to the South, which meant they were going to keep the South as just a producer of raw materials. And, and low income. Well, uh, finally, uh, uh, we began to uh, get some textiles moving down from the Northeast and from Massachusetts, for example. And of course, uh, there was lots of discussion <laughs> about what was bad for Massachusetts. And, as you know, I always worked with a number of the presidents, and, and so I was talking with President Kennedy one day. <laughs> And he said to me that he was not mad about it. In fact, he said I was upset when we started moving the factories from Massachusetts to Georgia. <laughs> but actually what happened was that other industries moved into Massachusetts, which were higher-paying industries than, than, were, uh, than the textile industry. So they, he felt like they were winning instead of losing. So he said... He wanted me to know he had no no real ill feeling towards the South. Good. good. George. Yeah. Could you hold just a minute? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's something funny about it. Do roll. that again. Uh, probably, but we're... You would mind telling us that story again? Yeah, okay. Okay. Well, you lead it out. You want me to start or you want to lead it off or what? When we're ready. Uh, okay, you just talk start about the South. Okay. The Civil War. Well, we, uh, uh, as you know, we do not call the war a civil war in the South. We call it <laughs> a war between the states. Now, prior to the, the war uh, between the states, uh, the South was the wealthy part of this nation. We had 60% of all the wealth of this nation. But... Uh, after the war, we had nothing. <laughs> we were completely destroyed, and uh, uh, and in addition to that, uh, we were 
subject to lots of laws that were worked out which were very bad for the South. For example, in the case, in order to be certain that we did not industrialize, uh, they had a, a law where we, uh, it cost twice as much to ship a manufactured product from the South to the North as it did from the North to the South. So uh, the whole idea was to make uh, the South just a producer of raw materials, that we could not process these raw materials into the finished product and get much higher prices. So consequently, um, we went through a long period. We didn't have any Marshall Plan, <laughs> and the Gone with the Wind story told at least part of our problems that we had at the South at that time. But at the same time, we eventually began to industrialize, and we moved from textile mills from the north, the northeast particularly, to the south. Now, we moved them some from out of Massachusetts, and uh, I was advisor to a number of the presidents in economics, and so I was talking with President Kennedy one day, and he said he wanted to assure me he had no animosity towards the South because we were moving his textile mills out of Massachusetts to the South. He said that uh, actually that worked out pretty good, that they had uh, changed these industries in, the, in Massachusetts to where they had better industries with high-paid jobs. And so they gained, although they were upset when it happened, that they actually gained economically. And for that reason, he wanted me to understand that he had no feeling of animosity towards the South. So I think uh, that uh, was good because we all won in a way because we desperately needed all the industry we could get in the South at that time. Our income was real low, wages were real low, and so consequently it was good for the South, but it was it worked out where it was all right for the Northeast. Could you talk about the role of textiles uh, uh, before the Depression in the South and what was happening to the South's economy before 1929? Well, we were having, uh, uh, beginning to have a weak economic situation in the South, really beginning in about 25, we began to go downhill. And uh, we were already moving down uh, by the time we had the Depression in 1929. Now, uh, of course, uh, 29 uh, uh, finished off everybody. <laughs> and actually, we became the economic problem number one of the nation. And when Roosevelt went in as president, we, of course, were in a poverty area. Uh, uh, the per capita, for example, the per capita income of farmers in the state of Georgia went down to $72 for a year's work. And we had as much poverty as you have in Asia or Africa today. And uh, so, consequently, we had uh, uh, lots of serious troubles. Uh, as I've told you before, I was a professor of agricultural economics at the university. And I decided to leave the university with the hopes that I could change, uh, help change this situation. Now, I didn't get much <laughs> encouragement. Everybody thought my economic ideas were wrong, but anyway, they worked. And uh, after I resigned from the university, the president, uh, in order to entice me back, uh, offered to jump me over people who've been there a long time and double my salary and everything else. But the worst trouble I had was with my father. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure I had fortunately cut off a year in grammar school and a year in high school and a year in college. And I started teaching in the university when I was 19. And I'm sure he'd been all over town bragging about having a son who was a professor at the university at 19 years old. And when I told him I was leaving at the university, he became very much upset. He got me in a room and sat me down and began to lecture me, saying that I was making the worst mistake I ever made in my life. That, uh, that I thought, because of my training in, in, in agricultural science and economics, that I could change these farmers because they were starving to death. But what I did not understand was they'd a whole lot rather starve than change. <laughs> and and, and, and I, he said, you can't change them. I said, well, I think I can. And he said, well, we're in disagreement on that. 
And I finally said to him, I did not want a family row, that I felt like that I had to do this regardless. And so, uh, I, as bad as that was, I think it encouraged me to work harder. And I worked about 18 hours a day to be certain that I didn't go broke and that I did improve the income of farmers, that I maybe doubled it, maybe quadrupled it because they were doing many things that were wrong. Now, uh, but we needed desperate at that time all the industry we could get in the South, and, uh, and textiles was the simplest industry that you could get. As you know, it's a lot simpler than many, than many of the complex industries that have come South uh, in recent years. But in those days, the textile industry seemed to be the, the desirable industry because uh, it was not too complex. So anyway, uh, the South gradually turned uh, from extreme poverty that we uh, developed after the war between the states. And uh, with no help, but I say, uh, we didn't have any Marshall Plan. <laughs> and so things were very difficult for us. But we've gradually, of course, brought the South up now to where the South is equal to about any part of, of this country and pretty well uh, all over the world. I mean, we are good. Now, you didn't explain to us what you did for the farmers. Well, what we did, let me explain to you. For example, it seemed to me about everything he's doing, doing was wrong as an agricultural scientist and economist. For example, the kind of fertilizer he was using. It took 12 to 1,400 pounds of sand to make it that sorry. Uh, you couldn't get it that poor unless you put that much sand in it. And yet he did not realize that he was buying sand, but that's what he was doing. He was not getting plant food that he thought he was getting, and he did not know that. Uh, but he was buying it because it was the cheapest. Sand was a whole lot cheaper <laughs> than fertilizer. So what's happening, the fertilizer industry uh, was really taking advantage of the, of the farmer in that they were selling them. This low quality product, it was terrible. And so what I, uh, one of the first things I did that we've, we've got to buy fertilizer plants, which, which we could buy cheap because they were broke too. They broke the farmer and the farmer broke them. And one of these economic circles going around and around, everybody broke. And so I could buy fertilizer plants very cheap. And then I said, we're going to take all the sand out of the fertilizer. We're going to make it high analysis. And then we want you to use twice as much as you've been using, and that's four times as much plant food. And we can double your yield. And so that's one of the programs we started. Another program, for example, it was in the case of corn. Corn was the largest row crop in the state of Georgia, more than five million acres. And yet the average yield of corn was 10 and a half bushels per acre. It had been there for 50 years, had not moved. And I decided that if we're going to stop poverty and hunger, we had to change that. So we put in a program working with the colleges of agriculture and the, and the experiment stations and the county agents and the vocational teachers. And we offered prizes in every county where a farmer, a, a forage boy or a grown farmer would produce 100 bushels of corn, we give him a prize. And so we put in this program and we gradually brought the yield of corn from 10 and a half bushels up as high as 86 bushels per acre. So we, we tacked poverty from many angles. Well, one of the things that I'm curious about is that was at a time when so many of the, the people were leaving the farms desperate to, to come into the mills. <laughs> Everywhere they could get a job in a mill, it was so much uh, more income than it was on the farm that everybody that could get off of the farm was getting off, and he was going uh, in the industry. And as you know, of course, we had uh, uh, quite a bit of, of our black population that went north. I mean, they went to D Detroit and uh, many other areas in order to get employment at, at much higher wages. But uh, anyway, wherever we had industry, people would uh, leave the farm in order to get a job. Well, actually, it was a supplemental income because there were lots of people who were farming, living on the farm, and part of the family were living, were working in town, maybe in the textile mill. So it worked out quite good economically. Well, 
were the New Deal farm policies forcing these tenants off the land? Well, uh, there was a good deal of a discussion of that, but actually, uh, I don't think that uh, that's correct. I think um, Roosevelt was anxious to get the income up. You see, he was coming down to the little White House, and he had first-hand knowledge. All he had to do was get out and ride, which he did, and he'd see a lot of his poverty. And so he had an intense interest, I think, in raising the income of, of, of farmers, and, and, and did. Now, for example, I was at the White House um, when he decided to um, devalue the, the dollar, uh, raise the, uh, change the gold content of the dollar. Well, of course, the dollar is a commodity just like wheat or corn or cotton or anything else. And if you're going to do that, uh, lower its value 40 percent, it meant the commodities would move, move, immediately move up 40 percent. And uh, so consequently, he did a number of things that raised income of farmers. And uh, that was one of the most dramatic things. And of course, uh, when I was over the White House and learned that he was going to do that, it, uh, it was a shock to me. I guess it was a temptation, too, in a way, because of an economist, I knew the price of commodities was going up, and all I had to do was walk out of the White House and get on the board, and I could be rich. But I never did that. I worked with a large number of presidents, as, um, as I've told you, and I never violated my confidence at, uh, at, uh, at the White House. Could you talk about Roosevelt and the textile manufacturers? I knew he, he knew a lot of them down at Warm Springs. Yes, he knew lots of the textual people. You could just start and say Roosevelt knew. Uh, yeah, Roosevelt knew a great many of them. Uh, the Callaway Mills, for example, were a big group there, and he he knew the Callaway as well. And uh, so he um, uh, he had, I think, an interest in uh, doing what he could to be helpful to the South. I, I always um, felt like he was doing all he knew how to do to be helpful. So he was um, intensely interested in the industry, in, in industry coming uh, to the South, and I think um, uh, made a, a real effort to, to be helpful. Now, there was a big strike in 1934, and uh, there was an effort to get Roosevelt to intervene. Could you remember that strike? I, I, am, I remember it casually, but I, I, I'm not uh, really that familiar with it. I remember it was quite bitter in a way, and, and I think it was probably had to do with unionization. Of, uh, there were no unions all in the South, and probably the unions were trying to get into the South. Now, later on in life, I was involved. I was on the War Mobilization Board with President Truman, particularly during the Korean War, and we had the problem that uh, they started to strike then. And I was the only one on the War Mobilization Board uh, from the South at that time. And so they asked me really to handle that situation, which I uh, worked with the Union people and told them we could not permit that, that, that we just couldn't stand it in a war period. And, and so I I met with the union people and explained the economics of the problem we had, that we needed these textiles uh, during the war period, and regardless of, of all the complaints they had, that the first thing we had to do was go back to work, and then we could work out some of the problem. So I, uh, uh, in effect, insisted that they be back on the job on Monday morning, uh, which they were uh, finally agreed to do. And uh, so uh, uh, we settled that one without any real terrible situation. I understood, uh, but as I say, I was not too familiar with it. I understood in the, back in '34 that the situation was quite w bad. It was not nearly that good. But we settled it in the, in the 51 or 2 in the Korean War. We settled it without uh, any real uh, troubles. I, I met with the union people, and uh, and we worked on an agreement. They'd go back to work, and then I said, then we'll talk about well, what your problems are, but we can't talk about them. You own strike. Could you talk about co-ops? You said co-ops were something fairly new here, 
And uh, you mentioned that you got that the blacks joined the co-ops and then they started voting. Could you talk about that? Yeah, well, uh, see, the co-op uh, had never been successful in the South. And uh, there had been a number of efforts, but they all had failed. And so consequently, when I um, uh, decided that we could make a co-op succeed and, and help uh, bring a lots of income to farmers, and do a lots of things that you couldn't do without a co-op. Uh, nobody seemed to agree with me, but I had spent considerable time, really, as an economist. I had gone to the West Coast and uh, worked with the Suncast, and I'd gone all the way into Canada. I'd gone to Denmark and Sweden and spent a summer with the co-op staff. And so I was convinced if you ran a co-op right, it could help raise the income level. Now, so consequently, uh, that was uh, one of the things I did when I left the university. I started the co-op in '33, and in order to bring uh, in greatly increase the income of, of farmers. Now, in doing that, I tried to make it into a, a very democratic institution, in that uh, every member would have a vote, regardless of the size of farmer he might be. And that was unusual <laughs> in, in the industrial world. Okay. Okay. Just a moment, please. That's right. You were in Carroll County, I remember. That's... It's, when he gets ready, I'll go with you. Okay. All right, sir. All right. Well, as you know, in the industrial world, uh, all the voting is done by the amount of stock you own. And so nobody had understood any of this business about one vote, one member, whether, whether you had stock or not. So I had uh, lots of explaining nationally to do. And there were lots of very serious questions. Uh, for example, I went to Carrollton, Georgia, to start Gold Kiss because it was the largest county in the state. It had more farmers in it and probably more poverty. And so, consequently, the business community, of course, uh, uh, was skeptical. Uh, at that time, a university professor didn't have much status anyway. <laughs> they figured lots of these university professors were freaks in some ways. And so, consequently, they were telling farmers not to join. And I had to have a meeting of the business community in order to try to explain what I was trying to do. I explained to them, I said, the average per capita income of farmers in this county is $72 for a year's work. There's no way you can make a dime off of a farmer who's making $72 for a year's work. Now, right or wrong, I think I can double that, maybe quadruple it, if you'll work with me instead of oppose me, and, and if you'll stop telling these farmers not to join, because I think I can do it. now. Maybe I can't, but you fellas ought to give me a chance to see if I can do it. And so finally they said, I said, you can't make a dime off of a poverty-stricken farmer, but if I can get his income up, you can make something out of him, and then you have a dime to go in the bank. And so they finally said, okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you go for a while. Well, fortunately, everything worked out, and we doubled the income and quadrupled it. And so consequently, uh, I began to get invitations from other areas, even the business community, saying, come and put in a unit in our area. Use the word co-op. Co-op. And uh, so, but it was a new kind of economic deal, and people are always afraid and skeptical of things they don't know about. It's just a human nature thing. But the co-op uh, meant that I began to pour money into uh, Carroll County and wherever I was because I not only sold the products out of that county, but I sold it all over the world. I gradually opened the markets all over the world. And so I explained to them that it was an entirely different thing, that if I were just a company that was owned in uh, Detroit, for example, that I would take the profits and move it to Detroit. But in this case, I was going to Detroit and getting money and bringing it to Carrollton and dis disbursing it to farmers in Carroll County. So I was reversing the economic pattern that they generally had. 
that if you got industry, men mostly from the south, from the north, brought to the south, they were still owned in the north, and naturally they expected their profits to go back to the north. But here was a case of where we were taking the profits and gathering profits from all over the world and concentrating them in Carrollton and dispersing them to farmers. So I said, it's good economics if, if I can do it. And so I finally convinced the, com the business community that it, that it made economic sense and that they ought to help. And I finally got help from the, them, and that was true all over where I built uh, Gold Kiss over a large area. Could you talk about the d democratic thing of the, them voting? Yeah. Now, what I did... Uh, uh, this was an unusual voting situation, but I, I made every member a, a voting member, whether he was a small farmer or a large farmer. And that uh, was true of black farmers, the same as white farmers. Up to that time, uh, no black uh, had been permitted to vote in the South for anything. And so, uh, consequently, it was rather unusual that they had a chance to vote. But when we would have our annual meetings at the courthouse at these different places, uh, we uh, uh, let we passed the ballots out to everybody. I mean, uh, they, to every member that was there, black or white. And so, really, for the first time, I guess, uh, in this part of the world, blacks had a chance to vote uh, the same as white. Because this was not a political deal, this was an economic deal. And I felt that blacks had just as much right to double their income as white had to double their income or quadruple it. And so consequently, um, I made the blacks equal. Uh, there had been, of course, a good deal of criticism that blacks were not treated equally economically. But they were treated equally here because uh, as far as we knew, we didn't know whether the member was black or white. Uh, all we knew was economics. The whole job was to double the income. Why do you think that uh, there were so few blacks in the textile uh, factories? I really uh, uh, wondered about that, but apparently somehow or another they didn't seem to fit into the textile industry at that time. And, uh, and, and in noticing the mills, I noticed uh, the, the, all the employees were, were white. There were very few black employees. And I'm not sure just why that was true. Uh, there might have been an economic reason for it, but frankly, I do not know. Now, you grew up uh, in Georgia, uh, and right through from the First World War on, there were lots of, of attempts to organize and have strikes and get better wages and so forth in the textile industry. Uh, you were a farm boy. Did you uh, observe that? Did you have any comment on it? Well, uh, as I said, I, I, I heard about uh, that in the, uh, in the 30s there uh, they had it, and I read it in the papers, but I was not uh, directly involved in any way. And so consequently, uh, I was not uh, very much involved, and I, so I didn't know too much about it. You, the only time you know a whole lot about something is when you're involved in it, and I was not involved in the strikes. Now, I was involved, as I said, uh, in the Korean War. I was on the war board with President Truman, and when they started to strike up in Virginia, the textile mills up there that looked like might spread all the way across the South, to all the textile mills, uh, Charlie Wilson, who was chairman of the board, uh, was kind enough to say that he was going to put this and uh, that I was from the South and that uh, uh, I, I think I was the only one from the South on the War Mobilization Board was Truman. And he said he was going to put this in my hands. Now, the way I felt like we had to do it was to get with the, uh, the Union people and sit down with them and say to them that first... Uh, we had to go back to work because we had to have the textiles for the war effort. And then second, we'd listen to their problems and, uh, and see what we could do to, uh, to help. Now, we had the union people, of course, who were working in the war board all the time. I mean, they were, uh, we had uh, Phil Murray, who was head of the CIA. We had Walter Ruther, who was his secretary. We had uh, the head of the AFL-CIO, uh, 
and uh, George Meany, who was secretary of that. So we had all of them pleading their cases all the time. So we were very familiar with the problem. But we could not stand strikes. I mean, we, you just can't stand strikes during war period. Could you talk about uh, Eugene Talmadge? Uh, well, uh, Eugene Talmadge is probably one of the s smartest politicians <laughs> that we ever had. He he, uh, he played up the fact that uh, he was, uh, you would think he was uh, rather ignorant and he, he had red galluses. <laughs> he put on a great show, but actually he was a very brilliant person. He was a Phi Beta Kappa at the University of Georgia. Very few people know that. I, I don't believe there's one, peop one person in Georgia in a thousand that knows, but he was Phi Beta Kappa out of the state of Georgia. So he was real sharp, but he, he, you would hear him, you'd think he was quite ignorant, but he wasn't. He was one of the sharp people, and he knew how to play politics, and he was very smart. Now, of course, the newspapers gave him lots of trouble. They, they really worked him over. But uh, I was with him one time, and somebody asked him, didn't he object to what the newspapers were doing to him? And he said, no, he'd rather be called anything on the front page of the paper than an angel on the back. <laughs> so he, he understood his politics. And um, probably at that time, see, he was at a very unusual time in Georgia. And, of course, he was uh, appealing to prejudice. Uh, most politicians were. And so, um, but he was a very uh, shrewd politician. I say that for, for him. There were lots of things that he did that uh, uh, that people disagreed with, and uh, and uh, uh, but uh, he knew how to get the votes, and uh, but he uh, of course was defeated uh, later on in life. I mean, he ran against. Uh, uh, Senator George and was, was defeated. He ran against Senator Russell and was defeated. But he was very successful in being, in, in being elected governor. When we talked before, you said that uh, he was a scoundrel. Well, I, I, I didn't say that. I mean, you might have thought that. Uh, I, I, don't, uh, I had lots of admiration for the fellow in many ways. I didn't agree with lots of things he was doing. I disagreed with it. But um, uh, at the same time, uh, you have to give him credit for the fact that, uh, that he was smart and that uh, he was playing politics based on the situation as that ta at that time. If he had uh, done otherwise, he would not have been elected. Uh, he'd been defeated. And uh, he was smart enough to, to do that. Now, that's been true of uh, lots of politics and politicians. Uh, you run on prejudice. I mean, you've got uh, uh, one picture of, of uh, violence. Uh, uh, turned all, uh, Bush was elected. Uh, he just had to have one picture, that's all he needed, to show what happened up in New Jersey. And he, he was elected president. He won everything from Virginia right on through Texas and Oklahoma. So prejudice, is, whether we like it or not, is very often used in politics. It's not good, uh, but it's, uh, it's a terrible weapon that's used. No. Now, and, and, and I say this, that uh, Governor Talmadge was uh, excellently knowing how to use the weapons. He, he didn't need anybody to lead him around. Now, you knew the farmers very well. Could you talk about their attitude towards the textile workers? Well, I don't know that there was any particular uh, feelings between farmers and textile workers because actually lots of the textile workers were coming off the farm. That's where they came from. And, and there were lots of families that uh, part of them were farming and part of them were working in the textile mill. So you had a pretty close uh, relations up there between the, uh, the, the two setups. Did you know any of those farmers? Did you work with any of those farmers uh, who moved back and forth from the textile mills to the? Well, I'm 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 work with the families. Yes, 
because I work with the families that stayed on the farm. I mean, the, the part that stayed on the farm, I work with them uh, constantly. And, uh, uh, and although I was not directly involved in the textile industry, I knew, of course, part of the family that was working in the textile mills. Now, you were a very bright young fellow. In, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> in that period. And a lot of bright young fellows were coming up in textiles, like the Callaways, like uh, uh, Donald Comer, like that. Could you talk about that, that uh, generation of young textile manufacturers? Yeah, you had a, a young group that uh, went to Tech, Georgia Tech, for example, and took textile engineering. And so they became the leaders of, uh, of the textile industry in the South. And uh, so it was very helpful. I mean, they became very great industrialists. And they were really very helpful to the South because they knew what they were doing. They were highly trained and uh, graduates of uh, textile institutions. And, uh, and as you know, Georgia Tech had a big textile industry, and uh, they were one of the top institutions of the country on textile. So consequently, the institutions um, uh, did a great job. Uh, I never bragged on tech too much, having been a University of Georgia professor, but, <laughs> but anyway, you have to give them credit for what they did. Now, this is very important to us because People seem to get the idea that it was only the mills that were moving down from the north. Actually, it was a lot of those young fellows in the south who were improving the industry. Well, what they were doing was building new, new mills. They weren't just getting mills from the north. They were building new mills. And they were highly, highly trained, highly skilled textile people. And they were the ones who really built the industry. Now, the, some of these mills that moved down from the north, of course, started the industry. They got it going. But it was these young people that went to institutions like Georgia Tech that really made the textile industry, and they became the great leaders of, of the South. Did you know any of those people? Oh, yes. Oh, well, yes. I knew lots of them very well. I, I knew the Callaway as well. I knew the, uh, the Comers over in Alabama, and I knew a great many of them knew them quite well. Uh, in fact, I knew them real well because I was selling cotton to them, <laughs> and, and uh, I had to go and visit with them. So, uh, like Bib Manufacturing Company in Georgia. But all of those people, if you look at them, all of them were trained in the South. They didn't come down from the North. They were all trained in the South. That's very important for us to get from you. Yeah. Now, could you talk, just think back a little bit and see if you could remember any of the things they said about the development of industry, those young fellows, when you got together with them. Well, uh, they of course had a great ambition to make the textile industry not only successful, but to be the best textile industry in the world. They, they, they wanted to make it number one. And not some uh, were successful in doing that. If you look at um, these big uh, textual setups like West Point uh, Pepperell, for example, it was originally a, a, a uh, Massachusetts institution, as I recall. But the, uh, the Southern crowd who were trained down here took it over, and they took it over and started operating it. And they did great with it. They did a great job. And you have Callaway Mills, and you have all the, the Como Mills over in Alabama, and they did a great job, and all up in the Carolinas did a great job. Well, now, they insisted, however, that there be a, when the, remember when the NRA came in and the code came in? Yes. They insisted that there be a deferential between the southern rate and the northern rate. Why do you think that was true? Well, uh, are you you talking about uh, payments, you mean, right. uh, wages? Well, I think uh, there'd always been that difference. Uh, that's what pulled the mills that came south. That's pulled them with cheap, cheap labor. Well, they uh, wanted to maintain that difference uh, and, and not let uh, the NRA uh, change the whole economic setup. And that's uh, inherent that you don't try to change the whole economic situation uh, by government. Uh, you don't order uh, economic change. Uh, 
you, you followed the pattern that's already there. And so you already had that pattern here that there was a differential in wages between the North and the South. And they wanted to continue that. They wanted to continue that. They wanted to continue and, and, and have that situation. But you were making a big change for the farmers that, uh, that didn't depend on uh, any kind of differential. Oh, no, no. Uh, the whole idea in the farmer was that I could bring them all up. <laughs> And I wanted to get them to where they were the the, uh, the greatest producers and, and the highest income group. I wanted to take them from the bottom to the top if I could. And I, I was working on that, uh, on that uh, system. Well, now, you were negotiating with these very smart young fellows for the price of cotton. Yes. Uh, so the farmers had you to, to negotiate for them. Yeah, I not only did that, but I changed some of the patterns of marketing cotton. You see, um, in the early days, uh, all the cotton was sold, and about all that the uh, average buyer knew was whether it had been rained on or not. Now, I, I had gone in to lots of these mills, and if you'd go and look at a mill, there were ends down all over where they were spinning to uh, make thread. Uh, they would break. And, and I thought, well, that's foolish economically. And uh, I, I developed out if I could train some classes of cotton, people who worked and, and could determine not only the color of the cotton, but also the length of the staple, and put every bale of cotton exactly the same length, that I might could get the mills to set their spindles in such a way that they would not have so many uh, down, uh, spindles down. And so I went and talked with the mills and said, if I could train my people to put this cotton in absolutely even running lots, according to Staples, for example, every bale will be an inch, you know, or an inch and a 30 second. Now, can you set your spindle to where it will uh, prevent these uh, breaks? And they said, yes, uh, yeah, but can you do that? And I said, yeah, I think I can train them to do it. They said, well, if you'll do that, we'll, we'll pay you a premium for your cotton. And so uh, I did that. I trained my people to do it, and they paid me a premium. The, the mills did. And I could pass that premium on through to the farmer. Could you talk about uh, the efficiency that uh, came in the mills in the late 20s and early 30s? Well, I, I'm really not familiar enough with that to know, but I'm sure they were these. Uh, you see, if you get some highly technical people, uh, they go <laughs> they go make tremendous improvements, which they were doing in the mills all the time. I'm sure, and they were improving the mills. But at the same time, I was trying to improve the quality of the product that that I was selling the mill, so that every mill could buy from. From, from Gold Kid, uh, the kind that he wanted to produce, the kind of goods he wanted to produce, and uh, and and pay me a premium for it. Well, it was successful because uh, I was able to raise the price of cotton to farmers about a cent a pound. Now, uh, uh, through this system, uh, and consequently, I pulled cotton a hundred miles into Carrollton because every farm that was twenty percent. Cotton was bringing five cents a pound, and if you get them six cents, that's twenty percent up. And so, um, uh, lots of the old type cotton people didn't know what I was doing, and they got all upset. And uh, one of our field men came in very much upset, saying the Georgia legislature was going to investigate me. And I asked him what they're going to investigate me for, and they said raising the price of cotton a cent a pound. That nobody could do that, and I was doing something that was wrong or maybe dishonest. That nobody could raise the price of cotton a cent a pound, and that they were going to investigate me. And so I, I told him, I said, that's the finest thing in the world could happen. I want to be investigated for raising the price of cotton a cent a pound. I was raising the income to a farmer's 20 percent, and I want to be accused of that. <laughs> he was rather all excited, and when I told him, I said, you go, go back and tell them to investigate me. I want to be investigated. 
but uh, uh, it was a case of changing your pattern of how you uh, did things economically. One last thing, and this you may not have any memory of this, but we've been looking at a lot of newsreels at the time, yeah. and they show a lot of use of the, the National Guard and Talmadge calling out the National Guards and so forth. Do you recall that, and how did that strike you, if you recall? Well, actually, um, I was not involved in that, and so uh, I don't know whether it made too much impression, probably made some impression on me, but uh, not uh, serious. But um, uh, I presume Talmadge was trying to uh, uh, keep the textile mills coming south, maybe, or building new textile mills, and, and he was working with the textile people, I would think. That would be my guess about it. But I was not personally involved in any of that, and I really uh, didn't know. Um, he, um, as I said before, he was a whole lot smarter than uh, most people thought he was. He, was, he wasn't near that dumb or that stupid. He, he was a Phi Beta Kappa who graduated the University of Georgia. And although he played that part some, uh, he was about as sharp as he come. And uh, it proved by the fact that he kept being elected governor of the state of Georgia. That uh, you can't keep doing that all the time. You can't fool everybody forever. And so uh, uh, he it was playing the part that he thought apparently that that was best. But at the same time, it created great animosities and great uh, upsets. I'm I'm sure lots of people were violently upset about what was going on. Because nobody likes the National Guard being called out for anything. Okay. Uh, do you have anything more that you'd like to tell? No, me? you just said something about you wanted my age, and yes, I, I didn't know whether you yeah. want to do that or not. You might want to ask me. Okay. Uh, now we're talking about uh, 1934. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us how old you were then, and so? <laughs> Well, I was born on September 11, 1901, so actually uh, uh, I'll be 89 in, a, in a, about two months from now. I'll be 89 years old. Um, that's a long time, and I've lived through a long period of time, so I've been very fortunate, really, in, in my health. I've been in excellent health all my life. I try to exercise. I watch my diet some, and I watch my weight. And uh, I, I do walking, fast walking, and I have some funny things happen there, of course, in time. But at the same time, uh, it means that uh, I think there's a, a close relationship between good physical condition and whether you can stay in there mentally or not. And as you know, memory is a thing that's bothering lots of people. and. Lots of people accused me of having too good a memory that I remember some of the things they want me to forget. But uh, about the best story I heard on memory was one I heard the other day. They said the man and his wife decided uh, that they were having too many memory problems. And what was trouble was they were trying to remember too much. And uh, the man said, I tell you what, we'll, let's just divide this memory problem up said, you remember what our name is, and I remember where we are. So, so I think lots of people have this memory problem, but I fortunately have not had very serious memory problems up to the present time. Well, now, how different does the South look today from the South that you knew when you were, say, 22? Well, it's another world. It's, uh, it's just I, to say the South is another world from the time I was, say, 20, 22. Yeah, it's another world. Back then we had poverty and hunger and uh, bad economic conditions. That uh, See, we really never recovered uh, from the effects of the war between the states. It, it persisted for a long period of time, and all the economics were set up to keep us impoverished. And so uh, it took a long time to overcome that. But today the South is booming, it's doing well, and it's up there even now, and it's, uh, we're doing quite well. So, and we have great institutions. As you know, I'm on the board of trustees of several institutions, University of Georgia, 
Emory University, and Emory's becoming one of the great universities, and the University of Georgia has moved up tremendously. So we, uh, we have great uh, institutions now in the South, and they're training lots of wonderful people, and they're building the South, and it, uh, that's the way you do it. And, uh, and so I think the future of the South looks better to me every day. And would you say that the South needs uh, low-pay industries or deferentials? No, I don't think we need it anymore. I think. Uh, just, sorry, I don't think that we, the South needs. You want to cut out my question, yeah. see. Yeah, I don't think the South needs any di differential anymore. I think we're equal now. And I think we are equal in every way. We have capital down here. We have trained personnel. We have highly skilled people who are graduates of great universities. So I think that day is past in the South. I think we're equal. We don't need any preferential treatment anymore.